Today's class is going to cover the book of Veggie Tales. I mean, Jonah, that's what I meant to say. Yeah, Jonah, that's it. Here's our key concepts for the day. What we're going to talk about is the form or the genre of the book of Jonah. Then we'll talk about when it was dated. How do we know, uh, how do we know when this book was written? And then we're going to talk about the message of the book of Jonah. Now, the first thing we need to talk about when it comes to the book of Jonah is the issue of what genre are we reading, or what I've put as the form here. Jonah's different than most other prophetic books. And what makes it different than most other prophetic books is it's a story, just like, jo just like Esther and just like Ruth in a lot of ways. Think back to Amos. Um, think back to Isaiah, to Jeremiah. There's a lot of oracles going on through that particular book where there's just kind of a lot of, it, it feels like a long rambling speech. Now, hopefully my dramatic reading of Amos changed your mind about prophets at least a little bit, but Jonah, by comparison, I think is a very easy read. It's prose, it's a narrative, it's pretty straightforward. It doesn't have those long rambling speeches that are found in the other prophetic books. So that's what makes it different than other prophetic books. It has only one oracle, and it's a narrative in form. Now, it's worth noting here that because Jonah is a prophet, um, I probably should have talked about it last unit, but this is the one time all semester where I cheat. Because Jonah is a prophet, um, he's not part of the writings like everything else that we're talking about here. But I'm cheating a little bit because thematically, I think the message of Jonah fits in a lot better with what we're talking about right now than in the section on the prophets. We'll see if you can notice that in a couple of minutes. So a little bit of background on the book of Jonah. We believe that the book of Jonah was written at a very different time than when the um, than when it is set, just like Esther, just like Ruth, just like Daniel. Um, the book of Kings tells us about a real prophet from uh, who lived during the Assyrian period when the Assyrians were threatening the northern kingdom. And so the story of Jonah does talk about the prophet Jonah going to visit the Assyrians, who is... Uh, uh, and their capital city of Nineveh. But we don't think that it was written during the time that Jonah was actually alive. Like the other books we've been looking at, we think it's probably post-exilic, meaning it was written after the Babylonian exile. And there's several different reasons why we think this. Um, one of the reasons for this is Simply put, the conversion of the city of Nineveh, which had the king of the Assyrian Empire in it, is not recorded else, anywhere else. And the idea that the Assyrians, the Ninevites and the Assyrians, converted to the worship of Yahweh doesn't... It's difficult to understand why the Assyrians would have then attacked the Israelites if they were both on the same religion, if Israel was the birthplace of their newfound religion. So this seems to suggest to us that perhaps this story of Jonah is not really about Jonah the prophet, but is about Israelites in their post-exilic state, and Jonah is just a convenient way of preaching a message to these people. There are some other elements in this book that suggest to us um, that the story of Jonah is, is meant to be a story designed to teach the Israelites a lesson. Now, that's not to say that Jonah is not a real person. He, do, he does seem to have been one in, in, in the book of Kings. But what I'm trying to ex suggest here is that the story of Jonah, as we have it in our Bible here, 
uses the life story of Jonah as a way of telling the Israelites something about themselves. Um, one of the ways that we can, one of the many ways we can know that is, for instance, the most famous part of the book of Jonah is where he's swallowed by the big fish or whale. <laughs> the, the amusing part about that story is that in, in the story, in the original Hebrew, the fish changes genders. It is initially referred to as a boy fish, and then it is then referred to as a girl fish. This may be a, intended as a humorous element to uh, suggest to the Israelites, uh, try not to get too focused on this part of the story here. This is a, sto this is a storytelling device here. Then in addition, there's another part of this. The city of Nineveh has 120,000 people in it, which is a big city for the ancient world. That's about the size of Waco. But it takes Jonah three days to walk across the city of Nineveh because it is so big. Now, Waco is big. It would take you a long time to walk across the city of Waco from one end to the next. But I think that it would be it would not take me three full days to walk across the city of Nineveh. So these may be de storytelling devices designed to emphasize to the Israelites, understand Jonah as teaching you something about yourselves. It's not necessarily meant to teach us something about Jonah himself. All right, so we have the story. I've got a couple slides on the story, as has been the case in the past. I don't feel the need to retell you the story here. I want you to read the story for yourselves. If you haven't done so, again, pause the video here, go back and read the story. You can use my prompts to help guide your reading if you need to, but again, Joan is a really simple, straightforward story. You guys can handle this no problem. All right, so this, this slide finishes up the story of Jonah. And now we move on to the questions. By now, you should have read the story of Jonah. And so now we can analyze it in a way very similar to the way that we, uh, very similar to the way that we have analyzed Esther and Ruth. We're going to treat it like a novella. And so let's do so by analyzing the character of Jonah. Pause for a moment and tell me and, and, and think about the character of Jonah. All right, usually at this point, students will tell me that Jonah comes across as basically a whiny child. He is very selfish. He is not interested in following God's will. Um, he, he's whiny. Um, he's not obedient. Now, if that's the case, if we are to say that Jonah might be symbolic of something, or someone, as I've suggested earlier in this. What would Jonah represent? And the easy, obvious thing to say that Jonah represents, then, is Israel. He is a prophet who talks to God, just as God talks to the Israelites. So Jonah probably is meant to represent all Israelites. And so Israel is being portrayed as a bunch of whiny, selfish people who are called by God to do something, but they don't do it. And so God punishes them, just as God punished Jonah by him ending up in the belly of a whale or a fish for a period of three days. If this is meant to be taken symbolically, think for a moment what, this, what moment in Israelite history the... Um, the time in the belly of the big fish would represent. Okay, hopefully you've thought of your answer. And some students have occasionally tossed out the idea of slavery in Egypt. And if that's what you said, that's a pretty solid answer. Um, but I would suggest that's probably not our best answer. I think the better answer is going to be the Babylonian exile. Because Jonah seems to represent Israel living in the time of Israel before the Babylonian exile. And so the time in the belly of the whale would represent, uh, would represent that Babylonian exile, a period of exile, filth, 
nastiness, separation from the land, all those kinds of things. And so Jonah, when he spat out of the whale, represents Israel in their current state. And so they are given, and so Jonah goes to the Assyrians, or excuse me, he is offered the opportunity to go to the Assyrians and preach to them. When he preaches to them, how do the foreigners respond to this? And what we find is that the foreigners are surprisingly receptive to the message of Jonah, despite the fact that the Assyrians are the natural enemy of the Israelites, people who conquered their kingdom. And so your typical Israelite, as soon as they think, as soon as they read about an Assyrian, would have thought along the lines of what Jonah appeared to be thinking, uh, especially in the Veggie Tales movie, oh Lord, please don't send me there. They're a bunch of evil, filthy, nasty, disgusting fish lappers. We do not want to be associated with these people. But if we really look at the way the Ninevites are portrayed in this story, there's really not that many negative things said about them. And we've seen in this class in the past that there's a lot of times where the Bible will go out of its way to intentionally disparage an enemy of the Israelites if it gets given the opportunity to do so. And yet the Ninevites, the worst thing that we can say about them is nobody told them how to behave. So how could we expect them to be good people? Now, Jonah's not trying to suggest the Assyrians are just fine and dandy. They do need to become obedient to God. But the way they're portrayed is more ignorant rather than evil. And they need Jonah or Israel to explain to them what the right way to behave is. The sailors, the foreign sailors uh, who Jonah uh rides on a boat with at the beginning of the story are portrayed in a very similar way. They are just decent people and they surprisingly end up worshiping Yahweh or calling on Yahweh to save them from the storm uh, even though Jonah, even though they don't naturally worship Yahweh. So there's a little bit of foreshadowing with the foreign sailors and that they are going to be willing to worship Yahweh, just as the Assyrians are eventually going to be able to worship Yahweh. And so if the story of Jonah ended on the note about, hey, the Assyrians are worshiping Yahweh now, just as the foreign sailors did, that would be a great ending to the story. It would be a very simple, straightforward story telling us about the importance of evangelism or something along those lines. But that's not how the book of Jonah ends. Instead, the book of Jonah ends on a very sudden note. Listen to the final paragraph. This is starting in chapter 4, verse 9. Actually, we'll, we'll start a little bit early. We'll start back with verse 6. So after Jonah has, after Jonah has convinced the Assyrians to turn to Yahweh and worship him, Jonah goes up onto a hillside to wait and watch, hoping to see the fireworks, hoping to see God wipe out the city. And while he's waiting there, we start with verse 6. The Lord appointed a bush and made it come up over Jonah to give shade over his head, to save him from his discomfort. So Jonah was very happy about the bush. But when dawn came up the next day, God appointed a worm that attacked the bush so that it withered. When the sun rose, God prepared a sultry east wind and the sun beat down on the head of Jonah so that he was faint, uh, so that he was faint and he asked that he might die. And he said, it is better for me to die than to live. Then God said to Jonah, is it right for you to be so angry about that bush? And he said, yes, angry enough to die. Jonah comes across as my, like, I think my six-year-old does to me sometimes. Then the Lord said, you are concerned about the bush for which you did not labor and which you did not grow, 
It came into being in a night and it perished in a night. Should I not be concerned about Nineveh, that great city in which there are more than 120,000 persons who do not know their right hand from their left and also many animals? And that's how the story ends. We would love to have a more complete ending to this book. We would love to know what happened to Jonah. Is he just, does he just sit there and wait to die on that hill? If we were to go to Nineveh and dig into the hillsides around Nineveh, would we find some bones of a guy, uh, perhaps with a grave that says, here lies Jonah, the, the, the petulant child who, who was uh, angry at God? Or does he say, oh, you're right, God, good point, and goes home and deals with his life? We don't know. And that's because the story, again, is not really ultimately about Jonah. It's really ultimately about Israel. And the original reader of this story was Israel. And so the, when God is talking to Jonah, he's not really talking to Jonah. He's talking to the Israelites. And so the question at the very end is meant as a rhetorical question for the Israelites that they are supposed to answer for themselves in this particular moment. Look, Israel, you guys are concerned about trivial matters like bushes, shade trees, vines, whatever it is that you are worried about. God's worried about bigger stuff like the whole world like 120,000 people in the world. What's your response to these people going to be? Are you gonna keep being like you are in Ezra and Nehemiah and pushing them away or going even further than that like you do in Esther and maybe even killing these people? Or are you going to be more open to them? Are you going to be willing to see that, you know what, they're not so bad after all? They're just ignorant and that they can worship Yahweh if you just give them a chance. The choice is laid out before Israel. The answer that the book of Jonah obviously wants us to come to, the conclusion it wants us to reach is to say, oh, foreigners aren't so bad after all and we should be welcoming of them. We should go out to them and we should preach the message uh, of Yahweh to them. But it is left as an open-ended message for the Israelites because they need to come to their own conclusion about this particular story. So we come to the end of the book of Jonah. We come to the end of our discussion of Israelites and foreigners. We have three books which have emphasized that Israel needs to somehow, some way, separate themselves from foreigners. And we have two books that have suggested that Israelites should embrace and be welcoming of foreigners and have a more positive attitude towards them. Understanding this background is critical to understanding what's gonna happen in the New Testament. Whether the, Israel, whether the new Christian church should be welcoming of Gentiles or whether it should be limited just to Jews. The reason why a lot of people want to limit it just to Jews has to do with this hundred year long conversation that the Israelites were having in the Old Testament over what is the Israelite relationship between Jews and foreigners. For the most part, the, the perspective of Ezra and Nehemiah was winning out throughout Israelite history. We need to separate ourselves from the foreigners. But there is this undercurrent that we find in Ruth and Jonah that suggests foreigners aren't so bad after all. And it's that attitude that Jesus, and especially Paul in the New Testament, is gonna pick up on and try to emphasize in their works later on. And hopefully your New Testament teacher will develop those ideas for you or has already done so uh, in your New Testament classes. All right, when we chat again, or when I talk at you at a, again, um, we will begin to discuss wisdom literature and the book of Psalms.